In this video, we're going to finish off discussing the chapter four questions in practice exam 1.2 in the fall 22 semester. And this question asks about the compound potassium phosphate, K3PO4, in aqueous solution. And which of the pictures below best depicts the, this ionic compound when it's dissolved in water. And note that water molecules have been omitted for clarity since there's a massive number of water molecules just in each of these little boxes. To begin to think about this, I think it's, it's helpful, first of all, to take a look at K3PO4 and really break it down into its component ions. This is a skill that I recommend students practice over and over and over again because it's something you're going to have to apply repeatedly throughout general and organic chemistry as well. So if we think about what happens when we take K3PO4 and dissolve it in water, really there are two things that happen. The K3PO4 formula units get surrounded by a shell of water molecules and separate from each other. The formula units separate. That's what we refer to as dissolution. But then each of those formula units contains ions that can be surrounded by water molecules individually. And this occurs as well, and that's known as dissociation. When dissociation occurs, we end up with a solution that contains those separated ions surrounded by what we call solvating water molecules. And here, with the formula K3PO4, we end up with three K pluses and a PO4 three minus anion for every formula unit of K3PO4 that dissolves. So you can think about this in molar terms with three moles of K plus and one mole of phosphate produced for every one mole of K3PO4 dissolved. So knowing this, we can recognize, for example, that the ratio of K plus to phosphate in the solution must be three to one. And that's going to be key to these pictures. The ratio of positive potassium ions to negative phosphate ions must be 3 to 1. This allows us, for example, to rule out image B, where we see only three potassium ions together with three phosphate ions. One thing to notice about image B, for example, is that the net charge here is not zero. We've got plus three due to the cations, but negative nine due to the anions. And that's going to be problematic in any of these pictures, in, in any microscopic picture, even microscopic picture, of an ionic solution, we should expect a balance of charges among the solute ions. So we can rule out image B as a result of either the, the problematic stoichiometry, we're lacking that three to one ratio, or the fact that charge is unbalanced. What about image C? Well, something similar is going on in image C. In fact, it's even more problematic, right? We've only got three positive charges, but we have, what is that, six times three, negative 18 charge. So there's massive net negative charge in, in image C, and the stoichiometry here just doesn't match our expectations of three potassium cations for every one phosphate anion. So we can rule out image C on the basis of that problematic charge situation or the problematic number of ions in the box, equivalent ways of, of saying the same thing in a way. And now we're into the interesting contrast between image A and image D. Images A and D both reflect the proper 3 to 1 ratio of potassium to phosphate, and that's worth verifying on your own. Pause the video, count those cations and anions, and verify that in each box there is a 3 to 1 ratio of K plus to PO4 3 minus. The difference between image A and D comes down to whether the formula units are dissociated or not. Notice that in image D, we still have the formula units intact with K plus sort of associated still with the PO4 three minus. Whereas in image A, each ion is off by itself, dissociated, surrounded by a shell of water molecules, which are hidden in the image, but implied there as a result of the process of dissociation. And so now with an understanding of what ionic compounds do when dissolved in water and the implication that they in fact do dissociate into their component ions. And this is the origin of things like the conductivity of ionic solutions and things like this. We can recognize that this depiction with the formula units still intact is actually not physically realistic. It doesn't reflect, for example, what we know about conductivity and the numbers of distinct particles. We can actually measure using colligative properties the numbers of particles dissolved. And image D just does not reflect the empirical situation. In fact, 
image A is the appropriate image here. Ionic compounds do dissociate, and K3PO4 is no exception to this. Ionic compounds, as a rule, when dissolved in water, do dissociate completely so that their component ions are individually surrounded by a shell of water molecules, and that is exactly what's implied in image A, where each ion is off by itself, separated from the other ions that were present in the original ionic salt. Speaking of dissociation and dissolution, question 16 is a conceptual question about dissociation and dissolution. And actually, just to jog our memory on this, I'm going to harken back to the previous question where we looked at potassium phosphate. Dissolution, dissolution refers to the conversion of K3PO4 from a solid to an aqueous situation with those formula units still intact is one way to think about it. This is what we call dissolution. And it corresponds to producing a situation like we saw in image D on the last slide, where the formula units are still intact. They haven't dissociated. Dissociation corresponds to this separation of the ions into individual aqueous species. So for example, 3K plus and 1PO43 minus. Now, truly separated, when they've truly separated, we say they've dissociated or that dissociation of the formula units has taken place. Okay, so with that prelude out of the way, let's see what we've got here in terms of the statements. Dissociation can only occur after dissolution. Yes, that's true. Those formula units have to be surrounded by water molecules first before water can get in there and sort of pull apart, you can almost visualize it, the individual ions. So yes, that's absolutely true. HNO3 dissolves and dissociates completely in water. HNO3 is a strong acid. It's in our list of strong acids. Put it on your crib sheet if need be. And as a strong acid, effectively the definition of a strong acid is complete dissociation of the acid into hydronium and in this case nitrate. So that's absolutely true. NaOH is a weak base, so it dissociates only partially in water. That would be true if NaOH was a weak base, but it is not. It is a strong base, and so that's false. A non-electrolyte can dissolve without dissociating. Well, this is 100% true, and a great example of this would be something like sucrose, which is table sugar, which absolutely can dissolve in water, but does not, for example, produce a conductive solution or does not dissolve to give more particles than the number of particles we dissolved initially. And so a non-electrolyte like uh, sucrose can, and in fact, quite often does dissolve without dissociating. A weak electrolyte dissolves only partially. Well, this may be true for certain types of electrolytes, but it's not something that's always true. Weak electrolytes can be 100% soluble. Something like acetic acid is a good example of that. But... Um, and so dissolve fully, but dissociate only partially is really the word there that's key. If that word were dissociates only partially, then this statement would be true. And finally, a strong electrolyte dissociates completely, but does not dissolve. Now, this is also false, given what we said in the first state, right? Dissociation can only occur after dissolution. So for a strong electrolyte to dissociate completely, which strong electrolytes do, they have to dissolve completely as well. So that one's going to be false as well. Finally, here we have a question that relates to precipitation. We're combining two solutions, Na3AsO4, sort of an arsenic analog of sodium phosphate, and AlBr3, aluminum bromide. Aqueous solutions react and a white precipitate forms, and we want to know what is the net ionic equation for this reaction. So in order to do this, I'm going to draw on my knowledge of the solubility rules to deduce the identity of the precipitate first, before I start worrying about which ions are spectators and what the net ionic equation looks like. Just want to get a handle on what is the product first. And in order to do this, let's mentally separate the cations and anions in each of these compounds. So we have Na3AsO4. AsO4 3 minus is our anion there. And we have AlBr3, and Br- is our anion there. And we have Na plus cations, and Al3 plus cations as well. So now let's imagine switching the dance partner, so to speak, switching, let's say, the anions, and seeing which compounds we end up with. The compounds we end up with when we make that switch are NaBr 
And I'm not worried so much about making things balance here, stoichiometry, all that good stuff. And AL, AS, O4. Okay, and now we can ask about the solubility situation here. NaBr, is that a soluble salt? Well, Na plus is a group one cation, Br minus is a halide anion. All solutions, all salts of group one cations are soluble. And so NaBr is indeed a soluble salt. And so NaBr is going to remain dissolved in aqueous solution in this case. And by default, since we're told, right, that a white precipitate forms, that this means that the white precipitate must be the, I guess, aluminum arsenate, you would call that here, right? Aluminum arsenate has to be the precipitate formed. And so the active cation, the cation that's really doing the business here is the Al3 plus cation, and the anion that's really doing the business is AsO4, 3 minus. The Na plus and Br minus are just kind of along for the ride here. Right, And so, for example, we could write a, a full-blown molecular equation for this. And, and let's go ahead and, and try to balance things out here. We'd end up with three NaBrs and an AlAsO4. And uh, the stoichiometry, actually, of the reactants works great as written. So there's our full-blown molecular equation. And in thinking about the spectators, the thing to notice is, well, Br- minus pretty much does nothing, starts off as Br- minus and ends as Br-, minus, and Na+. Plus pretty much does nothing, starts off as Na plus and remains Na plus throughout the reaction. So the net ionic equation will omit those spectator ions and will include only the Al3 plus built into aluminum bromide and AsO4 3 minus built into the sodium arsenate starting material and the product will be the solid formed from those two ions. And so just to make this crystal clear, let's switch colors and uh, let's switch colors to orange and write in the spectator ions. So for a full-blown balanced equation with everything in the molecular equation accounted for, we would add three sodium cations in aqueous solution. And um, let me add those actually under the arsenate since they came along with the arsenate. And we would also have three bromide anions, which came along with the aluminum. Now, what, I'm, what I can do now is actually just copy and paste these, right? Since they're spectators, they do absolutely nothing. And they're still there on the product side as three Br minus and three Na plus on the product side. So the net ionic equation is what you see in purple, where we have sort of canceled or subtracted out the sodium and bromide cations leaving only the ions that actually do the business. And here, the um, net ionic equation here is right there, written a slightly different way with the anion first. ASO4 3 minus in aqueous solution combines with aluminum 3 plus in aqueous solution to give aluminum arsenate, ALASO4 solid.